just food systems. We do this through three primary focus areas, science and technology uh, that Elliot and I are part of. We exist to accelerate the research and development in alternative protein by identifying technology bottlenecks and opportunities, and then engaging with the scientific community, both in industry and academia, to find solutions to those, those challenges and work on those opportunities. Our corporate engagement team works with food retailers, startups, large food and meat companies, investors, to help them understand the market, the consumer trends, so that they can make the best investment and uh, strategic business decisions. And then our policy team that, that Emily is part of exists to create a fair regulatory playing field for alternative protein companies and research, and also to help governments around the world um, put, put more money into alternative protein research. We do this here in the US, but also through our international affiliates in Brazil, Israel, Europe, Asia Pacific, and, and India. And one of the questions that drives our work at GFI is how will we feed the 9.7 billion people that are projected to live on our planet by the year 2050 with a food system that is sustainable, efficient, and uh, specific, particularly for this uh, webinar today, safe. And one way to look at this question is to look at the amount of land that we currently use today for food production. If we start by looking at the Earth's surface, about 30% of that surface is made up of land. And we use today about 70% of that um, or 70% of that surface is habitable. The remainder is, is glaciers or barren, barren land that we wouldn't be able to live on or grow things on. Of that habitable land, we currently use 50% of it for agricultural purposes. The remainder is forest, shrubland, and a small amount of urban and fresh water. Of that 50% that we use for agriculture today, we use over three quarters of it for livestock production, that includes both land to grow the animals that we use for food, but also the crops that we grow to feed uh, to those animals. And then just under a quarter of the agricultural land is used for crop production that we turn into food for humans to eat. And what's interesting is when we look at the amount of protein that comes from those two segments, it's actually reversed. So of that 75, 77% that we use for livestock production, that only provides a third of our um, global protein supply through meat and dairy. And two thirds of our protein supply is provided through those crops that we grow for human consumption. So what's the reason for this, uh, this flip or this dichotomy? It's really uh, a consequence of the inefficiency of the animals that we grow for food. If we take the chicken, which is the most efficient of uh, terrestrial animals that we use for food, it takes nine calories of energy in to produce just one calorie of food. So that's an 11% conversion rate because the chicken needs energy to walk around, to breathe, to grow. And beyond this inefficiency, this inbuilt inefficiency of, of the animals we grow for food, there are a number of other risks and challenges associated with industrial animal um, agriculture. And this slide presents a number of them here. I won't go through, through all of them, Many of you on the webinar are probably aware of the problems with greenhouse gas emissions and deforestation, but many people are not aware of that industrial animal agriculture or intensive farming is the number one user of, of fresh water uh, resources on the planet and the number one global user of medically important antibiotics, which is driving antimicrobial resistance. But despite this, uh, all of these challenges and a rising awareness of these challenges, the demand for meat around the world continues to grow and shows really no signs of slowing. And this is happening in all, all parts of the world. And it's not just a consequence of that rise in global population that I referred to before. It's also a consequence of um, changing uh, income brackets inside countries. So as, as um, populations of countries move into higher income brackets, the um, demand for meat, the amount of meat consumed goes, goes up as well. And so it, at GFI, our theory of change is that while, you know, you can tell people to eat more greens, 
uh, grains and beans every day. Uh, most people don't want to do that. They want to continue eating meat, egg, and dairy products because they like the taste of them. So our theory is to make meat in a better way. And we focus on three technology areas to do that, using plants or proteins from plants to create meat analogs, using fermentation technology, and using animal cell culture, or so-called cultured or cultivated meat, which is where we'll focus today. And this area of, of cultured meat, so or cultivated meat, what this, uh, what this means is that we're making genuine animal meat um, that has the same sensory and nutritional profile as conventional meat because it's made up of the same cell types arranged in the same three-dimensional structure as conventional meat and we'll talk more about this later on in the in the presentation and this area of this industry of cultivated meat has really exploded in recent years gone from just a, a handful of companies in 2015 to all of the companies that you see on this slide here. And we have a range of companies that you can see on the right of this slide that are focused on creating products for consumers to eat, from beef, chicken, pork, and, and seafood, to the companies on the left that are creating technologies for these B2C companies to use to create cultivated meat. And we now see uh, cultivated meat startups in over 20 countries around the world. About a third of those uh, exist in the in the U.S., but we're seeing rapid growth in uh, the establishment of, of cultivated meat startups in in other countries around the world. So really, a lot of growth in both the the number of companies, the different types of species that are being worked on, and the different types of food products and technologies to support those food products being researched and, and innovated on. And so, how are these companies, particularly those on the right, those B two C companies? How are they doing this? So this is a very general schematic and, and Elliot in the, in the next slides will go into far more detail on what this manufacturing process looks like. But at scale, um, when these companies are, are at scale in manufacturing actual products that consumers can eat, the general process will look something like this. So if we start on the left, cells will be isolated from, a, from an animal, typically through some type of um, non-invasive biopsy. Those cells will then be um, purified so that they're able to work with a specific type of, of cell, typically a stem cell. The, there's then a cell culture uh, part, a cell starter culture part where those cells are then expanded in, inside a small vessel. Then they're transferred to this first phase of cell proliferation. This is most likely going to take place in, in a large tank or so-called uh, so bioreactor or fermenter where uh, nutrients, uh, typically called cell culture media, are provided to those cells that uh, allow them to grow and divide and, and proliferate. There might be some type of medium recycling involved, so the, the costs can be uh, driven down. Once enough of those cells have been proliferated and we have enough of those cells to work with, we then move to the second phase of this process, which is uh, called tissue perfusion. And, and this process serves to take those undifferentiated stem cells and differentiate them into the, the cells that make up meat, primarily fat, muscle, and fibroblasts or connective tissue that you can see on the bottom of the cell. So this change in conditions, typically a change in, in the type of bioreactor that's used, the addition of a scaffold, change in the nutrients that make up the cell culture media, all, call, all cause those cells to receive different signals and push them towards those cells that make up meat. This entire process is gonna take roughly about six to eight weeks. So generally much faster than the time it would take to grow an animal for, for food production. So with that, I'm gonna um, stop and hand it over to, to Elliot to dive into the details of um, cultivated meat and food safety considerations. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, David, uh, for that introduction. Um, so let me just share my screen. Everyone should be able to see that now. So in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'd like to really expand upon the concept of different process stages um, and introduce you to how there are shared and different considerations for each stage. And then what we're gonna do is jump into more specific information on key topics like antibiotics or animal serum and genetic modifications, and then kind of close with 
what this overall means um, for food safety as it relates to cultivated meat. So David just introduced this sort of general overview of the process, and I'd like to kind of break this down even further into five independent stages that sort of have clear differences and considerations amongst them based off of what equipment might be used or what type of work might be performed, et cetera. So in general, food safety concerns are going to be product focused, while a lot of other considerations may be process focused. And this means that ultimately most of the safety considerations for the consumer are going to occur somewhere around this sort of stage four to stage five interface where the product is being formed and packaged. So we're gonna go through each of these stages individually in the coming slides, but I first wanted to kind of briefly cover how different regulators have initially approached this framework. So in the United States, at least, the FDA and the USDA, which are two separate agencies, have stated that they would work together um, to jointly oversee the cultivated meat process, where the FDA would oversee the upstream collection of tissues and the process of growing those cells, while the USDA takes over sometime during this harvesting stage, um, and they'll ultimately oversee the packaging and labeling of the product. So this approach is fairly unique, um, and most other regions that have some sort of novel food regulatory process in place have stated that those sort of existing frameworks can fit the oversight for new cultivated meat products. So just a general disclaimer for, you know, this schematic before I move on, as well as the upcoming slides is that, you know, this is just for informational purposes and nothing here should be taken as any sort of formal recommendation or final description of any process, but it's obviously um, well informed based off of what we currently understand. So the first thing um, I wanted to touch on is, you know, this concept that some safety considerations are unique uh, to each stage while others are shared across multiple stages. So for instance, during stages one to four, the cell culture media that David mentioned may contain certain recombinant proteins or small molecules that are used to assist the cell growth and differentiation of those cells. And depending on what these are and the amounts that are used, um, they could pose a safety risk. But this risk doesn't really exist for the consumer at stage one, because really anything that's being used here is going to be gone by the, times, uh, by the time those cells reach stage four. So the way to think about testing is not to worry about every component at every stage, but just really for the potential harmful components at the relevant stage. So for this you know, example, for instance, we, this means that we could apply residue testing um, to see if any potentially harmful or undesirable residues are left on the product prior to packaging that could be harmful to the consumer. And so we'll talk about that later at stage four. So similarly, uh, cells that are grown in this bioreactor environment may produce certain substances that are at different levels than in an animal, and that could ultimately also pose a safety threat. So for instance, if that substance happens to be an allergen. Um, but again, this subs the amount of substance um, could change throughout the process so that we could probably focus again at testing uh, at the stage the product is formed and, and no longer likely to change. So the, the amount of substances being produced at stage one could be different at stage two and stage three, but ultimately what matters is sort of the, once the product is formed and, and no longer likely to change. So lastly, the, the risk for contamination by different adventitious agents like viruses or bacteria also exists sort of throughout this entire process. But here it's a little bit different because we wanna do testing immediately when a new cell line is being formed. And that will ensure that uh, those cells don't contaminate the process or pose any safety risk right from the start. And then once we know this, then we can just simply monitor the process to detect if any contamination events occur and then likely you know, do some additional tests as needed when the products are, are being packaged. So now that you have you know, some familiarity with this concept of different stages, I wanna walk through the main considerations um, in each stage and then talk a little bit about the testing and guidances that we already have that we can rely on from other industries um, to regulate and oversee uh, cultivated meat. So as Dave, David mentioned, uh, the first stage really involves the procurement of cells or tissues from an animal, and then from that animal, uh, biopsy creating a cell line, uh, performing some sort of quality control of that cell line, and then ultimately banking those cells. 
So one of the best ways to sort of limit uh, a cause for contamination is to simply procure those cells from a healthy animal where the disease status and the history are known. So this can be easy for some animals that are kept already in closed flocks or herds and um, you know the disease histories are known, but it could also be more challenging for other species like marine life that don't typically have that information attached. So as mentioned, we'll wanna also test for adventitious agents um, that could exist in those cells or tissues and are being brought into the lab. And we'll also wanna validate in some way the identity of the species and as well as the cell type that we're working with. So this is the stage where genome modifications can also uh, be performed and we'll talk about that in more detail later. And then as mentioned, the sort of differences in the components of the media that could pose a safety threat namely these small molecules and recombinant proteins are sort of consistent throughout each stage. So from all these other industries like the vaccine industry and biopharmaceutical industries that use animal cell culture, there's a decade's worth of studying guidelines that can be relied on and translated to the cultivated meat industry to really guide how we think about ensuring the safety of these considerations. And so Throughout this, I'll, I'll kind of just list out um, some of the reference materials that might be most useful in guiding our thinking around each certain stage that already exists. And it also, in these guidances, point out different tests that can be performed or that have been developed um, that can uh, you know, test for certain uh, safety considerations listed here. So you don't really have to know exactly what these tests are or, or, that they're, or how they're performed, but the point is really um, to demonstrate that we know how to do specific testing and what tests are most likely to be used by cultivated meat manufacturers. So for instance, the testing of different adventitious agents like viruses and bacteria are really well described and used in other industries, similarly to those um, for cell identity. The only difference is that some tests may need to be developed specifically for species used in cultivated meat rather than for like a human species that are used in, in other industries. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, the media substances will talk about testing at uh, further stages. So in stage two, you're going to be focused on scaling up the production of how those, uh, of those cells that were previously deemed safe from stage one testing. So ultimately there's fewer things to worry about here. And the focus is kind of on uh, monitoring any changes in your process. So things like monitoring the pH of the media or the oxygen consumption rates or the overall health of the cells that could indicate a contamination event. And so there are a variety of different uh, sensoring equipment and monitoring tools that uh, become attached to these bioreactors that I'll talk about later um, and that are used in other industries. And they can be used to really monitor the uh, event of, of potential contaminations that may, may occur. Uh, additionally, there are also guidelines um, that can be used to, to guide us on how to clean and sterilize this equipment for normal production runs um, or in the event of a contamination. And these are kind of listed out here in the relevant guidelines. So in stage three, um, this has really most of the similar same considerations as, as stage two, except the bioreactor environment might change, but ultimately the safety considerations aren't that different. In stage three, you may introduce uh, a scaffolding material that can provide cell attachment and or structure uh, into the process that ultimately helps um, form uh, structured meat products or aid in the differentiation of those cells. Now, typically these scaffolding materials are expected to be either edible or biodegradable and they come from sources that are already approved for food consumption. So as long as this holds true, there really shouldn't be too many additional safety concerns at stage three than those otherwise that I just kind of went over um, at stage two. So stage four is where you'd be harvesting the product after the cells have been differentiated and matured. And the harvesting stage could involve some sort of collection of the cells, as well as some sort of processing of the cells into a final shape prior to packaging. And there are ultimately a lot of uh, different ways that this could be performed, and it's likely that different companies um, could take different approaches at this harvesting stage. Um, but nevertheless, you, you're going to want to confirm that the product being harvested is free, again, of these adventitious agents and is indeed the product that you intend to sell. So, for instance, confirming 
that your batch of chicken nugget product is actually composed of chicken cells and, and doing that testing to confirm that. And these tests um, that you see listed here for those assays are very similar or in fact the same ones that you would use at stage one. Now a concern for any novel food product is the potential introduction of, of novel allergens. And existing allergy testing requirements for new foods can be adapted to cultivated meat where a variety of analyses um, ranging from things like uh, looking at sequence similarity through databases of, of existing allergens to applying uh, serum challenges from allergenic uh, people with cross reactivity to certain allergens or performing enzyme digestibility of certain allergenic proteins or uh, suspected allergenic proteins. Um, all these tests can be performed and then a sort of weight of the evidence um, can be considered whether something is likely to be allergenic or not before a product is deemed safe to sell. So similarly, um, as, at, as I mentioned previously, at stage four is where you want to do testing for any of those potential harmful molecules or proteins um, that were used in the cell culture media previously. And you can kind of test, uh, test for this in the same way that we do residue testing in the meat industry or on crops for things like pesticides. The only difference here is that the manufacturers of the meat themselves may be using a sort of range of different small molecules and proteins, and that may require new safety data to be collected or um, basically individual manufacturers working with the regulator on a case-by-case -case basis to determine um, which pose a safety threat and which do not. So in stage five, um, these considerations are primarily now about the end product that's being packaged and how that package ultimately becomes labeled. And so there's kind of some open questions still around the nutritional and shelf life characteristics of cultivated meat products and how those compare to conventional products, um, in, at least in the public domain. Uh, but ultimately the manufacturers of those products will need to supply those data for regulators to um, perform proper labeling of the product. Additionally, manufacturers are generally also going to need to supply um, some information around the proposed use and use levels. So essentially, how much is recommended to be consumed in a given setting? And really, for all of these questions, there are a variety of different tests that are used throughout the food and meat industries to help answer these questions around the sort of nutritional composition of a product and the shelf life characteristics and other end, uh, end stage product characteristics of the products. So I'm gonna now switch gears and talk a little bit more in greater detail uh, about some of the um, safety considerations and frequently asked questions, um, starting with this sort of issue around how do, we, how do we actually prevent contamination and how does that enable us to not use antibiotics in this process? So the first um, is that many people that have done cell culture before um, are familiar with the use of antibiotics to prevent contamination. And they are generally working in this laboratory setting where you're moving a dish containing those cells back and forth between uh, the cell culture safety hood, uh, the incubator, the microscope, et cetera. And all of those together cumulatively increase the risk of contamination that we offset by adding in antibiotics. But ultimately we call this product cultivated meat and not lab grown meat for a reason. And that is because the production of the product won't occur in that lab setting that I just described, but rather in this industrial setting where the cells are being grown not in plastic dishes primarily, but in uh, stainless steel tanks or other bioreactors that are generally closed off from the outside environment and in an industrial setting with higher sort of safety oversight. So I just wanna walk through some of the preventative measures that are used in industry that really ensure the sort of sterile boundary that gets maintained when using a bioreactor. So the first difference is that in industry, generally you prepare all of the media com components from a dry powder in a separate vessel. And then once those things are mixed together, um, that individually gets sterilized such that anything from the media side that goes into the bioreactors to feed those cells is already sterilized and we know that ahead of time. Additionally, you can add in different filtration or sterilization systems at different medium or gas inlets and outlets and those can be used to actually capture um, different adventitious agents like bacteria or viruses that may exist. And so this is really an additive layer of protection to the bioreactor itself. 
Additionally, you can inject an inert gas like nitrogen to actually maintain a positive pressure within that vessel. And so the force of the inside of the vessel is actually pushing outward such that you uh, prevents things from coming inward essentially. Um, and then in industry, there's adherence to common good manufacturing practices, which staff and personnel have to uh, adhere to, to ensure the sort of safety of the overall procedure. And then finally, as I mentioned, and you can see in this diagram, there's a variety of different sort of sensor systems that can be attached to the bioreactors to monitor changes in the conditions that would kind of give the hint that some uh, contamination event has occurred. So all of this is to say that um, really a lot of effort has gone into figuring out how to maintain a sterile boundary in a bioreactor and entire industries really rely on these methods to deter antibiotic use in their production. So as I mentioned, contamination is always a risk, um, but prophylactic antibodies are, are really, or antibiotics are not the solution. Um, and so as I mentioned, you know, on top of these robust systems of prevention already exist, if you were to apply antibiotic use at scale, it's, it's quite expensive. And for this industry, it would be prohibitive to use them uh, and eventually achieve cost parity with a conventional animal meat product. Uh, additionally, the use of antibiotics can be detrimental to the viability of cell cultures or affect the performance of the cell culture where essentially, um, you know, everything that you've uh, optimized for a cell culture, if you add in antibiotics, can change how that cell, uh, cell line performs. And then finally, it's misaligned with the goals of the industry um, for sort of obvious reasons. Now, with all of this being said, antibiotics could be used um, to prevent contamination and loss of precious tissues at uh, stage one. And essentially, companies can go um, and, and commit a lot of resources to obtain a sample of tissue from certain species. And really, in order to ensure that those efforts aren't wasted, antibiotics can be used to prevent contamination um, from ruining those cells early on. But the overall volumes, um, you know, generally this would be at the milliliter scale of volume and the amount of time that, that an antibiotic could be used, maybe for a few days, is, is ultimately completely negligible to, compared to what's used in medicine or conventional agriculture. So again, just antibiotics are, are likely not to be used at all in the production process, but they could be used um, for a very short amount of time and in low volumes um, at stage one in some cases. So the next topic is, is the use of animal serum, um, of which uh, fetal bovine serum or FBS is the most commonly um, referred to as it's kind of a common supplement used in animal cell culture because it contains a variety of growth factors and hormones and other molecules that aid cell proliferation. But we've known for a while that uh, you know, there's a lot of problems with the use of serum in that it's very variable. Um, it's a potential contamination source, it's misaligned with animal welfare, and importantly, it's really an economic non-starter. So again, if you want to produce a product that's ultimately going to compete with conventional meat, the use of serum is really a no-go due to its uh, elevated costs. And so we have a really good basis actually in other industries of how to grow other cell lines and other cell types using serum-free formulations. And so it comes as really no surprise that six companies in the cultivated meat sector have already declared themselves as completely serum free. Um, and pretty much all of them have stated that they would never sell a product using serum. And so I suspect that actually many other companies in the sector have just not publicly announced themselves as being serum free. But this is a good indicator that the whole industry is already moving beyond serum and into serum free and plant based formulations. Just to sort of hammer this point home even further, um, in the last several years alone, the FBS prices have increased nearly 300%. And this is because you really can't keep uh, the FBS uh, demand up with, um, or the supply up with the demand of other industries. And this is because the profits for FBS go to the slaughterhouse and not the farmer. And so there's really no incentive to increase herd size just to match FBS demand. And so there's this, been this con conceptualization of peak serum um, brought about by the maturity and onset of uh, the cellular therapeutics industry that's been written about for the past decade. And we've already seen this sort of cost increase dramatically um, within the past few years due to that increasing demand. And this was actually written before cultivated meat as an industry was even born. And so together, the maturation of these industries are really going to push 
this over the curve where, you know, serum free media ultimately becomes the rule and no longer the exception, not only in cultivated meat, but I believe in other industries as well. And uh, this, I think, can happen on the order of just a few years. So with all that said, again, serum might actually be used at some stage in the process, specifically, again, for stage one to assist in the growth of uh, new cell lines that are brought into the lab. And so, again, going similarly to um, you know, what was talked about with antibiotic use, you want to really conserve precious tissues if you're using a lot of resources to acquire them. And in some cases, these species actually have no documented methods for how to handle or culture those cells. And so adding serum really works well to ensure that you can grow enough of those cells and bank enough of those cells that then you can use them for downstream experiments. Um, and so this might be uh, occurred at some companies at stage one um, for those reasons, but ultimately, as I mentioned, um, you know, it's highly discouraged throughout the rest of the process. Now the next question uh, comes is if serum is used, then are prions a threat? Um, and so for those that don't know, prions are the causative agents behind transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, of which mad cow disease is the most commonly known, um, but it can also occur in these other animals listed here. And there are a whole host of reasons why prions ultimately aren't a threat at all for the safety of a cultivated meat product. Um, the first being that prions are normally found in the brain and other central nervous system tissues and not in serum or muscle tissues, for instance, that will be used by the industry. Additionally, the majority of FBS actually comes from regions with no previous history of prions in those animal populations, and that is actually by design. And then finally, there's a preponderance of evidence that suggests that these prions cannot be transmitted by blood or serum at all. Even in the case of a pregnant mother cow with uh, a calf and that has mad cow disease um, and a shared blood system, um, those prions don't even transmit to the calf um, under those circumstances. And so the risk of prions I, from a safety perspective uh, is virtually zero for this industry. So the use of genome modification is, um, you know, this a big topic that has a lot of nuance attached to it. So I just wanted to kind of provide a general picture of, of what might be likely for the industry without going too far into the weeds. Um, the first point is that cultivated meat production doesn't require genome modification, but it can be used to improve the efficiency or the productivity of the process. Um, it could be used to alter the nutritional characteristics of a product or even how a product is marketed um, and labeled. So for instance, by removing an allergen. And this can be really important from an intellectual property perspective for companies in order to sort of differentiate themselves from a competitive, um, comp uh, competitive uh, point of view. And so some of the patents filed to date by different cultivated meat companies have described various genome modifications to the cell lines that they use in house. Overall, the regulations uh, have not really kept pace with scientific advancement, and this has been challenging to really align how we understand um, the science and how much of a safety risk is actually posed by modifying the genome. And recent regulations in plant crops, at least in the United States, have focused on final attributes rather than simply the methodology for modification. And this means that you know, a similar approach for animal cells, if, if taken, would ultimately make it likely for gene edits and other forms of modifications to become either uh, completely exempt from regulatory oversight, um, easily permissible or permissible on sort of a case by case basis, depending on what the edit is and what the gene um, that's being used does. So none of this is, is finalized at all, but I think if you look at current regulatory trends, I think it's likely that some forms of genome modification will be allowed even in early versions of cultivated meat products. So finally, kind of wrapping up is, you know, what does this mean overall for food safety and other food externalities? So as we discuss this sort of sterility of a product where there's no harmful enteric pathogens due to the slaughter process, um, is likely to result in a lower incidence of foodborne illnesses compared to conventional meat counterparts. Um, and along these lines, um, cultivated meat products are likely to have longer shelf lives and reduce spoilage due to them coming sterile off the line. And so this could have implications for reducing food waste um, due to spoilage. 
and also reducing food miles and the sort of climate impact costs due to things like refrigeration requirements when shipping meat. And so there's no publicly available data on this yet, but you can see a sort of founder of one of the cultivated meat companies describing how their product had uh, no decomposition at all after four days compared to conventional meats that were completely spoiled in less than 48 hours. And this is really, again, due to the uh, sort of absence of bacteria on these final products. And then finally, for seafood products, which again, are, 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 can be made throughout this whole process that we're talking about here in the same way, um, these are, will not have my, mercury or microplastics at all, which really goes to say that cultivated meat products in general have a variety of food safety related advantages compared to their conventional counterparts. And educating consumers about these advantages is expected, I think, to increase the likelihood of purchasing these products. So to wrap up, um, as we kind of talked about today, that you know, we expect this cell culture technology to enable the production of, of high quality cultivated meat and seafood products that um, you know, pose risks that cannot be managed effectively through understood methods um, and responsible production that we already sort of have a core understanding of, of how to do. And cellular events that are unique to cultivated meat can be characterized and, access, and, uh, and assessed with these existing and well-established tests, as I touched upon um, today. And then documented guidelines and tests exist that can be applied to cultivated meat to really identify and characterize any potential hazards um, that may exist and assess those risks accordingly. And then finally, as, as always, I think uh, a balance of these science and risk-based regulatory approaches can really go far to ensure consumer safety of new products while also not being overly burdensome to new companies as they try to enter the market. So thank you. Great. Well, um, I think we will, we will wrap up here. Um, I want to thank everyone um, for their time today and for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, I'll send an email to all of our attendees with the recording of this webinar as well as the slides. Um, if you're interested in learning more about GF's, GFI's work, I encourage you to, uh, to check out our website and uh, particularly explore the recently released State of the Industry reports um, if you're interested in a, a deep dive of the status of the cultivated meat industry. Um, I'll also be sending a webinar evaluation, so we, we really appreciate your feedback um, on how we can uh, improve future webinars. And feel free to email me directly if you have any follow-up questions. So thank you for, to all of our attendees and also to Elliot and David for your um, wonderful presentation. Thanks, bye. Bye.